Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to another Telecast. On this week's show, I'm chatting with two of the panellists featured on the Telecast Digital Content Forum, sponsored by BBC Studios, which is taking place on the 30th of November. My guests are Head of Digital Development at BBC Studios, Chris Allen, and Managing Director at Cowshed Social, Matt Ford. They're both coming right up on this week's telecast. My first guest on this week's show is Chris Allen, Head of Digital Development at BBC Studios. Welcome to Telecast, Chris. Thanks for having me, Justin. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm okay. With just an hour or so to go before England play their first game in the World Cup. Obviously fraught with controversy. Maybe we'll come Ooh. on to touch a little bit more on that later in the show. But I gather for you, congratulations are in order. Apparently so, yes. Um, um, yes, I got I got married last not last Saturday, Saturday before, but yes, and, and I've just come back from honeymoon. So yes, it's midday. And so I've spent the last three hours or so slashing through my inbox and uh, composing a very large to do list. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> this is a nice break. Yeah. This is a lovely break. Good. We're talking about all things digital this week. And now you're a, a bit of a digital veteran, if I may say so. I'm very old. Which, very is, old. Uh, which is a rarity, really, to have so much experience in such a relatively young sector of the content industry. Can you tell us a little bit about your career and how you've ended up as head of digital development at BBC Studios? It was never a conscious decision. I guess, you know, it's very kind of you to say digital veteran. I think, yeah, I'm I'm 38 now. And I remember badgering my parents first to get us a PC at some point in the 90s, uh, which they duly did, then badgering them relentlessly to get dial-up internet. It was really from that point on, I started to really love and see the power of what you could do with the internet, even when it was the incredibly slow internet of the past, uh, and Windows 98 or whatever it was. And I used to sort of make my own web pages, not that they were visible anywhere apart from on my own computer, but it kind of married together a love of, of, I guess, what I can now identify of like, making things look lovely and presentable and communicating stories and things and facts. I suppose in a, in a, in a previous generation, I'd have made my own, you know, school newspaper or something. So that, that's where that started. And, uh, but, 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 you know, my first love was always, was always being an actor. So I sort of traipsed off to university, did an English degree, like all people who don't know what they're doing at the age of 18. <laughs> and then I spent actually quite usefully some of that time at uni working through, you know, doing digital marketing for, performances and shows that, that we did and actually that taught me a hell of a lot about writing copy and photography and web design and and video editing and all of these sort of really useful skills uh, arguably more useful than me being able to translate um, um, some middle english or something sorry chaucer and i was able to ultimately sort of you know pay that forward into getting myself a job working for a for a website that uni owned and then i went and trained to be an actor for a year which was a sort of strange sort of sidebar but is an interesting part of the story we can talk about at some point. And then, I, and then while I was there, fell into working for Digital Spy, who were really wonderful to work for. I spent four good years there, and it was a mad sort of Wild West place to work. It was what, just after they'd been purchased. They'd been an indie for 10 years, literally, you know, boys and girls in their bedrooms running what had become an enormous entertainment website. And I was hired just after it had been acquired by Hachette Filipacci and Hachette didn't, I don't think, really knew what to do with it. I think they just put us in a corner and sort of wanted to watch to see how it worked mm. <laughs> because they're a very traditional publishing house at the time. We were next to sort of L magazine and Red and Inside Soap and sort of quite traditional monthly and weekly titles. And it was at that point where everyone was trying to acquire a, a .com and, and understand it. And I came on as the head of videos and pictures, which was a hell of a steep learning curve. Can you edit? Yeah, sure. I lied. Then you find yourself on in Leicester Square. I think one of the first premieres I went to was Watchmen, the the, the, the movie of the comic book. That's how long ago it was. And, you know, interviewing the talent. And then, you know, you get sent off to Cardiff to meet Matt Smith and you get sent off to... You know, I met Stephen Fry. It was just, it was mad. And I was in my early 20s and it was, re- and so was everybody else there pretty much. And it was really good fun. And it was a real baptism of fire and a real sort of just fling it at the wall and see if it would stick. It kind of wouldn't fly now. It was quite sort of anarchic. But that's sort of how I, I cut my teeth and became a, a digital producer. Mm. And then and then I moved that through into working at the BBC. I had a short span working um, 
somewhere else, but I wanted to see if I could work somewhere where I didn't care uh, if I could just do it for the money. It turned out that didn't work for me. And I was lucky enough to get a, a job at the BBC as a digital producer on Doctor Who. And I just two months ago celebrated 10 years of working at BBC Studios. Wow. <laughs> so my job has changed and evolved about four times in that decade. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm clearly going for the carriage clock and comfy slippers yes. um, um, <laughs> at the BBC at the moment. Yeah. But, um, what I find is really interesting, there are a number of executives in the digital space that have come from publishing backgrounds. Mm. You know, um, Alex Morris, for example, and, and Sam Barcroft, they both came from both magazine and the newspaper background. And when a lot of the disruption in the print sector, mm. the print businesses were looking towards video and thinking about how video could actually change their model as their websites came online or, or became very important about, you know, 15 years ago or so. So in terms of being a digital spy, obviously that gave you a really good grounding in creating short form clips, essentially. What is it that you think that you most learnt from those days? Because it was a very disruptive time, much much mm. like today's. Still even more <laughs> disruptive. It seems to have got even faster the disruption. But what what is it that you learned a digital spy that you think that you still apply to what you do now? Digital Spy was really interesting in that I think it taught me about speed, efficiency, and authenticity, actually. Digital journalism, because essentially that's what it was, it was all about speed of turnaround. And we're talking a time when you had to play your footage in from a tape. All you kids out there, oh, you used to have to set the camera up and tell it to play the footage back into the computer for you rather than off a card. You do your, you know, your interview with a talent or, you know, with the... Dancing on Ice cast or the X Factor. I met One Direction before they were famous, or when they were on X Factor in the you know having a bacon sandwich in the uh, canteen at London Studios back. You know all, all these. All, <laughs> it's very much a picture of the past, you know. And they were all twelve or whatever they were at the time, you know. And you you do that X Factor finalists talk to the press junket along with everybody else and all the print press and some of the other sort of nascent digital arms of the print press and and other and others. And then you would dash back to the office and you'd spool it in and you'd cut it up and you'd get it you know, approved and you get feedback. And, you know, you'd be trying to get it online as quickly as possible because that time is valuable, especially if you don't have an embargo on something. You're, you know, you're trying to get that news out before anybody else, especially if someone's told you something's really interesting and tasty. Mm. Not that they always did. The stuff about speed and efficiency. And then I think authenticity was the other thing, which is actually, uh, I think it's an interesting word that gets returned. It gets used a lot, but, but one that's always worth returning to, I think, in digital terms, which is there is a line between how slick and professional something should look and what the audience's expectation of a piece of digital content is. And I think sometimes we're all guilty of going too far into the slick and professional, especially in the professional publishing industry, whether you're a, a, a broadcaster or a paper publisher, making things a bit too razzle-dazzle, a bit too many lights, a bit too much makeup. It's the wrong visual language for being online. Mm. People expect and indeed adore rough and ready content that is authentic and really speaks of the creator. You know, you only have to look at TikTok. TikTok is basically full of that sort of stuff. You know, that is TikTok. Yeah. I think, you know, Digital Spy was really rough and ready. And I think anytime we tried to have a pretense of making things a bit too slick and shiny, our audience told us. So that's, I think, what, what the kind of, what I learned there, I think, in a nutshell. Now, we had Helen Pendlebury from BBC Studios on the show a couple of weeks ago, and she outlined the whole business, which BBC Studios is a big business. Mm. But uh, tell us a little bit about the digital division in particular. Tell us about your role and mm. what you specifically do as head of digital development at BBC Studios. Well, I sit within the snappily titled Digital Consumer Engagement Team at BBC Studios. It's our job to commission, curate and commercialise content around some of the BBC and BBC Studios best loved brands. Big key brands that we work for, the big sort of headlines are Top Gear, Doctor Who, Bluey, which is an enormous global super smash for anyone who has you know, children under the age of four, you'll probably have not been able to avoid Bluey. Uh, hey Dougie, we also operate the massive natural history and science uh, aggregator channel BBC Earth, and we yeah we manage uh, uh, you know upwards of about seventy odd channels and platforms for various different brands, probably about twenty or so uh, different brands in total. 
across various different touch points. And myself, I'm, as you say, the head of development. And my job is about spending money, which is great. Uh, <laughs> no, I work really closely with our uh, genre leads. And we have one for each. We have uh, four genre leads, factual, fact ent scripted and children's kids and families as we call it now and uh, i work really closely with those four to build out the strategy and the content strategy and pipeline around how we should spend and best spend our budget on original content commissions which we're aware is a is a is a real sort of premium extra you know so it has to be something that that we we feel we're gonna you know get significant eyeballs and or significant press attention to warrant making i sit with them and we've, we've indeed started it now thinking about next year because of course we we speak now having already passed six months of this financial year and thoughts already start to turn towards next and long-range budget planning and all that fun stuff so starting to think about where we want to go what kind of things have worked what kind of things perhaps haven't worked and why and really identifying and prioritizing where we can spend a, a reasonably limited, a healthy but limited pot of original content commissioning budget to, as I say, best attract, well, best achieve whatever the objectives and KPIs are for any particular given brand. So it may be to attract younger or more diverse audiences. It may be to maximize revenue. I mean, in many cases, it's a mix of most of those things. So that's my job in a nutshell. It, the reality involves lots of emails and the jolly bit, which is watching loads of wonderful content come back in from the really talented producers that we commission and watching it and going, oh, yeah, have you thought about maybe a little tiny bit more of this? <laughs> so when it comes to commissioning mm. original content based around some of your tentpole brands, does it have to be the originator or of their actual brand or would you go out to indies to actually create some original content around a show that another producer has made or how, how does that all work it's it's varied we work really closely with either the executive producer of um, an existing show brand if it is one that's running or the showrunner or the show creator or in the case of something long running and kind of creator list like Doctor Who or Top Gear or EastEnders that we refer back up to the BBC Public Service Commissioner, who is the ultimate owner of the brand for a, a given mm. time. We would work closely with them in terms of determining that decision. But most of the time, yes, we would work with the person who has the production rights to make that content. That said, there isn't always capacity or skill set or interest in doing that. So we will sometimes, as I say, in consultation with those key stakeholders, go outside and find uh, an, an indie to make it. Where we're able to have more latitude with working with indie producers is on stuff for BBC Earth, which is, a, as I say, a sort of natural history aggregator channel that we run. So it doesn't have a, a commissioner um, in the public service or an exec producer uh, who actually sort of owns that brand. It's So we have more latitude there to to shop around. Same on BBC Earth Lab, which is our science sister channel to that. So we sort of partly sometimes work with our studios productions colleagues, and sometimes we go out to indies. Um, and also increasingly now we're, we've got a comedy channel called um, Funny Parts, which we haven't publicly launched yet. It will be <laughs> being launched on the 1st of December, but it's uh, it's there and we're going to be looking to uh, look at sort of um, what we can do in the independent comedy production space as well to, to really sort of beef up the output on that channel. BBC Earth, are you commissioning longer form content as in, you know, traditional almost half hour or hour shows for that? Or is it much more focused around sort of short and mid form for BBC Earth? Yeah, I mean, that is an, a, an interesting one. At the moment, we are still very much in the classic short form space, of which I mean sort of eight minutes, something where you can put a mid-roll in it, if I'm really honest. Mm. What, what will become more interesting, especially on channels like that, is moving towards whether we do a series of, say, four or five, eight minutes uh, episodes, or whether we put some of that budget and expertise together to tell longer stories. So it's not something we've done yet, but I think it's something we'll definitely be exploring in whatever the next financial year is, 23, 24, 23, 24. Mm. Mm. So yeah, I think um, that's definitely something of interest there. When it comes to scripted and, and comedy work, I mean, I saw that you'd recently commissioned short original series, I think it was three part from Baby Cow called The, the mm -hmm. Train. 
Is it still at very early days for scripted comedy short form or or is it quite established? You know, where is comedy within the overall digital sort of content sphere? How is it performing? So comedy is, is a growing market and, and a very big market and a very lucrative market. It is, it is you know, a perennially popular space, you know, on YouTube, on Facebook, you know, it, I think probably second only to gaming on, on, on somewhere like uh, YouTube. It is, as your question alludes, an incredibly expensive venture. Anything scripted is expensive mm. and often prohibitively so. So we've dipped our toes, yes, with Baby Cow. I think the interesting thing there with Baby Cow, so we we run their their social channels on their behalf and we commissioned them to make these shorts. So a series called The Train, as you say, that was kind of like a traditional scripted comedy, single camera Tim Key, Kyle Smith Bino, Lucy Pearman, who also wrote it, the sort of awkward love triangle set on a train. And that's sort of in a more traditional comedy mold, scripted comedy mold. And then also we commissioned another series called What's Happening, which is a five part one from Alex and Ben, who are the pin, a comedy duo, um, who've, who've really did very well over the pandemic in their own digital social world. They've been, they've been gigging for years, but they kind of got a real prominence kick from the pandemic there was sort of one of that class of people who did really really well out of being locked in locked in their houses mm. what's happening is set in a in a podcast studio and was more kind of less in the mold of a, a traditional sitcom and more kind of a sketchy satirical view on things and and they're both really very funny and i'm both i'm proud of both of them and please do um go check them out if you haven't already on the baby cow youtube and facebook pages but they were very much there as development plays so we appreciate that the, the you know avod revenue is going to be tough to cover the production costs but in terms of the opportunities that it brings us to test new talent or up-and-coming talent to test scripts potentially as backdoor pilots and to develop and hone people's crafts as well as being a calling card for both ourselves and for baby cows like well look what we can do it's got a kind of slightly different objective to some of the other stuff where it's like yeah we feel this is a you know a solid natural history documentary that we know will, will do really well in terms of its avod revenue we'll know that we can potentially license it to somebody else to use on a fast channel somewhere or, or whatever mm. the objectives and the the uh energy behind the baby cow project is slightly different so it's not to say that that comedy is a no-go zone but it is like if we were to do a scripted drama very very pricey and i think in general our comedy will probably in the first instance we'll probably look to focus more around panel and or light end comedy and stand up and then i think the big interesting piece for us is going to be looking at what the lay of the land is when YouTube shorts begin to be monetizable mm. and where we can commission in that short space because psychologically like everyone loves short sketchy funny punchy comedy the problem is the the money doesn't stack up at the moment because we need things to be three minutes plus to get advertising on them eight minutes plus to get mid-rolls on them you know think all that kind of stuff right mm. what you really want though is a comedy sketch that's 30 seconds long where I can go ha Justin that's you that is you're just like this and send it to you ultra shareable yeah, ultra shareable stuff. Uh, my TikTok is just people I'm friends with sending me TikToks going, that's you, that is, or, <laughs> oh my God, I feel so seen. Mm. It will be interesting for the comedy, either the gag business or the sketch business, when we move into a monetized space with short, short, short content, be it YouTube shorts, be it reels, be it TikTok. So I think that's going to be an interesting evolution potentially. Why isn't it? Why isn't it monetizable right now? Because YouTube's big enough. You'll have to ask YouTube. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it must be. I mean, how long have, have shorts been around? Because they've been around for a few months now, haven't they? At least six months, I would have thought. I believe so. I I, I think the, the, the news on the street is, is next year we'll be looking at the uh, at being able to monetize those those opportunities. And I think that will be, that will be quite exciting because as you alluded to in the uh, earlier question, I think we, we're going to potentially see a future, potentially, where original content on digital sits less in this traditional short form middle ground of three to eight minutes mm. and actually polarizes far more down the loads of 30 seconds being commissioned and then a couple of really long form things being commissioned. I can see a future 
not so far away where that diversification happens and we start to move from from the current state to something much shorter and much longer. Yeah, it's fascinating. And obviously, mm. we might see the reemergence of Vine, of course. Now, uh, Elon Musk has acquired Twitter. What's your thoughts on that? Do you, would you expect to see it coming back? Who knows? I mean, yeah, I have no idea. I'd love to see Vine come back, mainly because... Why well, would I love to see Vine come back? Has TikTok stolen its lunch? It's difficult yeah. to know, because Vine, Vine was sort of extraordinary and unique at the time, the, the, the brevity... The ability to make you laugh super hard, super fast was, I think, Vine's great strength. And I, I don't know. Like, I'm, I mean, <laughs> a friend, a very dear friend of mine, had a birthday party, um, uh, his thirtieth birthday party, where everyone had to dress up as their favourite Vine. So I came as the woman. I just came holding a pint of milk because uh, I loved a woman who's someone in a car honks a horn and she throws a pint of milk in shock. Anyway, but it absolutely creased me up. I used to think Vine was so was so revolutionary in that respect. And the fact that it then integrated into Twitter, you kind of got that now mm. with TikTok. And so I don't know whether whether there'd be any point, but, you know, Elon might prove us all wrong. Uh, it may all be folded tomorrow. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's an inter- interesting time for super mm. short form content. So uh, so that's definitely something we'll be, we'll be looking at. And perhaps something we might be discussing at the Telecast Digital Content Forum, which, of course, BBC Studios is kindly sponsoring. And you're appearing on the AVOD Originals panel. So, Chris, thank you for, for doing that. And uh, we've got a, a really strong panel with Tom Pullen from Channel 4, Craig Morris from ITVX, and Garrett Kemming from Quintus Studios. So, and there's going to be a lot of, obviously, discussion around original commissioning for a number of platforms, including YouTube. Do you think that original commissioning on AVOD platforms has really come into its own recently? It feels like it's, you know, it feels like in the last year it's really sort of moved forward. Oh, 100%. Absolutely. I think in the last couple of years, you're right. I think um, you mentioned Tom there. I think four studios probably fired the starting gun, certainly in the in the UK about it. The maturity of the platforms, predominantly YouTube and Facebook in the first instance, but increasingly Instagram, increasingly TikTok, the maturity of those platforms, the ability to monetize combined with, I guess, a drop in production cost and a growth of a independent digital production sector, or at least the growth of digital production arms within big production players, be it your Fremantles or your uh, uh, anybody else have really sort of changed the, the equation and shifted it in favor of being something that's really viable. And I think also at the other end, so sort of rather than the, just the creating end, is then that the sales end has become, I think now, or is becoming more serious and more stable. So people going, okay, you've got that on your YouTube channel. What's the second window? Can we have it for our fast channel in LATAM? Can we have it for a, an English language learning VOD service in Singapore? Can we have it on BBC iPlayer? I think there are kind of those routes to alternate routes to market, alternate routes to audiences, uh, where there will be a, a more traditional program sales approach, I think are really interesting as well. And that's that's completed the puzzle, as well as the dropping costs and the and the maturity of the, the, the AVOD revenue on the platforms is then what you can do with it in a sort of secondary sales space. I think 2023 is going to be a really interesting year. As you say, you know, there's, uh, the, I mean, there's new platforms arriving all the time, but also, Ooh. you know, as you say, shorts, that's going to really fundamentally impact the way that the sort of content that's been produced and, and monetized in, the, in this sector. We talked a little bit earlier about BBC Earth and the projects he might be looking to commission in that sector and also in, in scripted. For any other indies that are listening to the show is there any other original content that you're currently looking for i realize you've been on two weeks on honeymoon so you're probably not thinking about it in too much detail but are there any other areas that you're open for pitches or or a particular piece of content you're looking for Next year, we will be focused around those three big key genre areas of natural history, science, and comedy from an indie production perspective. But I think I'm open to hearing from anyone, honestly. Um, if you have a astonishing idea that you think would be suitable for one of our big big name brands, great. 
although that we, is something we have to then discuss. But uh, but I think in the in the first instance, really, science, natural history, and, and comedy is going to be where it's at for, from an independent um, producer perspective. Um, but also, yeah, anyone who has skills in in doing ents, anyone who has skills in doing yeah, just good good solid companion content i think would be someone i'd love to hear from even if they're not pitching anything actively just it'd be good to know who's got great skill sets out there frankly i'm sure there's there's going to be lots of new indies setting up a new digital first businesses on the back of this you know there's obviously been a lot of redundancies recently in uh, meta and twitter and various other social platforms that are focused on Mm. content so you know we might see a whole new raft of small businesses working in that space coming through in the uh, in the coming months so that's going to be interesting no absolutely and i think it's it's duty bound on on big players like the bbc but also you know other other great multinational publishing houses with with heft and budget to support grassroots content production for for all types of diversity uh, frankly you know a kind of you kind of want to hear voices from from all over certainly the uk um and and potentially around the world digital is a great place to develop format ideas and on screen talent is a great place to develop off screen talent as well and now it's time for story of the week where my guests get to highlight the tv industry news story that's caught their eye in the past 7 days chris what's your story of the week Well, my story of the week is exactly seven days ago, which is that beloved, or not that beloved, clearly, Aussie soap Neighbours is set to return after being binned. Neighbours has been, you know, a key fixture in in British and Aussie life as a a soap opera since the mid 80s. Uh, used to be on BBC when I was a, a kid. It was sort of like soundtrack to, to Tea Time. And then it moved to Channel 5. And uh, presumably, we presume that the ratings had waned to a point where uh, it was no longer sustainable for uh, it to be made either in, in Oz and in, in the UK. And so in July, it was canned. And they had a big 90-minute finale episode. Madge came back as a ghost. But then last Thursday, it's been announced that Amazon Freevee um, Amazon's free-to-air uh, fast service, essentially, will be recommissioning it. As far as we know at the moment, with some of the same cast, at least, at least uh, Toady and Carl and Susan and, and, and a few others are, are in. because there was, Is Harold still in it? I don't know. Well, you see, they haven't announced any cast yet, but, but Carl Kennedy and Susan and Toady and uh, Paul Robinson were all in the little social video that was then released to say that it was coming back. Um, so that was a rather nice thing. They did a little social video. Although then there was a little bit of consternation, a little bit of controversy, because not all the cast had heard about this. So then there's a little bit of clucking about whether everyone's back or not. We're not quite sure. <laughs> but um, but yes, Amazon are bringing it back. I think that's going to be really, really interesting. They've also announced they're taking on the whole Neighbours Back catalogue, wow. which is going to be thousands of episodes. If you wanted to go back to the start, you can, you'll can you be able to watch them again. It's just going to be fascinating to see how... I'm not aware, but I'm also, I've not done a huge amount of research on this, but I'm not aware of a, what we call a continuing drama, what is less kind of called a soap, how that is going to work in um, the context of a streamer. I work really closely with the team who make EastEnders because we run some of their social channels and we've done some original content commissioning for, for EastEnders. And it is a, a huge body of work. There is a, a fantastic team up at Elstree in North London where this factory makes EastEnders four episodes a week, 52 weeks a year. It's going to be interesting to see streamers who are kind of used to a certain model, which is, you know, you pay a lot of money, but you make the thing and you pop it online, adjust to this kind of all year round approach. I think that's going to be really interesting to watch. Um, yeah. And of course, as we know, with certain other series that in the past have been rescued in inverted commas by streamers, it's not always a silver bullet. It's not always the you know, it's not always a, it could just be a stay of execution rather than uh, than a forgiveness. Do you know what I mean? There's, yeah. there's plenty of series that have gone on to be axed afterwards after not doing as well as the streamer had hoped. So, Yeah, no, you're right. It's going to be, I didn't realise that they'd uh, also taken all the back cattle, which is uh, obviously amazing news for <laughs> Fremantle. So they must yeah. be uh, very happy about that, which is one of their, you know, one of their key brands. And we actually had a show where we spoke to the production team on the, uh, on Neighbours a few months ago after, and mm. discussed how they were getting through 
producing during COVID. And uh, that, that was a really fascinating episode. We'll maybe put a link mm. to that, a chance to listen back. But it seems like, you know, uh, that's a really significant commitment. But, I mean, Amazon can afford it, of course. But Freebie is, is a brand that perhaps they haven't put a great deal behind up to this point. And this seems to be like, you know, a tentpole move for the Freebie brand. Yeah, and I think quite, yes, as you say, a real sort of tentpole move and a real sort of declaration of what the brand is, you know, that we're, you know, we're going to go for a continuing drama, something iconic, something that certainly most Brits will be of a certain age will be aware of, and we're going to bring it back and with its whole back catalogue. No, I, and I think it will be fascinating to watch how that develops and how they do the social and, and digital support for it. And they're you know, welcome to the uh, to the messy world of continuing dramas on digital, um, uh, where uh, you know EastEnders, Corrie, Emmerdale, and Hollyoaks. Hollyoaks bloody brilliant at it. Um, lock horns um, on a weekly basis to to grab everybody's eyeballs and direct them to the television. So yes. um, so yeah, neighbours are welcome back. Yeah, well, it'd be fascinating to see how the uh, commercial model of uh, Amazon Ooh. works within all of this. So uh, so we'll keep our eyes, as you say, we'll keep our eyes peeled for develops on that score. And now it's time for your hero of the week and who or what you're telling to get in the bin, Chris. So first of all, who's your hero of the week? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break your your lovely format here because I, they're, they're intrinsically linked so my so my hero and villain of the week are, are are joe lycett and david beckham and i think unless you've been on mars or something um for the last few weeks you probably haven't uh, failed to notice that the, the world cup is being held uh, has just started and is being held in qatar and joe lycett who i find absolutely fascinating this is sort of a, you know where, where it comes back to digital joe has developed i think in the last couple of years from just another really smart really capable really funny stand up and game show panelist to a kind of consumer and moral ethical champion using his substantial digital platforms to uh, activate campaigns that are often very very witty but also very smart and from there, leap into the sort of mainstream print press or, or, or uh, linear news. And so in this instance, he has taken aim at David Beckham. Beckham, famously quite a gay-friendly football star, certainly the one of the, the first and certainly the most famous to really acknowledge and court his LGBT fan base. But Beckham has uh, signed a deal to promote, do sort of tourism promotion for Qatar, where gay people have very, where it is illegal and where um, people's rights are quite heavily prescribed. So Lysit said that he would shred £10,000 of his own money uh, unless David Beckham renounced his 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 work for uh, the Qatari uh, government. And so uh, this weekend, Joe Lysit chucked £10,000 of his own money into a wood chipper. It certainly regardless of whatever you think about throwing £10,000 into a wood chipper during a cost of living crisis, I think it's brought an enormous spotlight to an issue. I saw a steal, steal a sentiment from Twitter. Somebody said, you know, this is an enormous... The, the, the amount of publicity that has been driven towards this cause is well worth that money. It would have cost more money to do that in terms of display advertising or, uh, you know, whatever. And, you know, it certainly has burnished Joe Lysett's credentials as the absolute king of this sort of new consumer ethical crusade that he seems to be really wanting to put himself into. And, you know, conversely for Beckham, I think many fans will be left feeling quite upset at his stance. And we we have discussed this on previous telecasts that, that only mm. recently that, uh, yeah, he's obviously got a hugely burnished and protected PR image and I was you know, quite surprised that he didn't even engage at all mm. with uh, Joe Lysett. Obviously, that was the advice that he was being given. I mean, so far, the video on Joe Lysett's Twitter page has just passed 3.2 million views in 24 right. hours. And with it, the role of uh, David Beckham as a gay icon, really. So uh, that is uh, that is interesting. It would be interesting to see what the fallout is. But a lot of celebrities i've seen lots of clips at pre-world cup as well i think there was a, a colombian singer 
who was being interviewed by Israeli TV network. And he walked out when he was being asked and quizzed about, you know, why he was performing when, you know, there's a lot of people have been criticized for taking the dollar. Mm. Let's probably best not get into that because everybody's got a viewpoint and there's probably isn't a, an easy answer to any of this. But but certainly Joe Lysett, has, uh, as you say, he's, he's carved out a new niche for himself after changing. He, re he recently changed his name to Hugo Boss and back again, yes. didn't he, to highlight Hugo Boss's uh, uh, past. They'd sent a cease and desist to a, a, a small brewery that was using the Boss, the, the name Boss. Yes. Uh, so that's why he changed his name to the, to Boss, so he could then start a fashion line. <laughs> Chris, thank you very much for coming on Telecast this week. It's been fascinating chatting with you. I'm really looking forward to welcoming you to the Telecast Digital Content Forum on the 30th November at the BFI South Bank. Really looking forward to that discussion. I will see you very shortly. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. See you soon. My second and final guest this week is another well-known digital content expert, and it's Matt Ford, now Managing Director of Cowshed Social. Welcome to Telecast, Matt. Thank you, Justin. Great to be here. It's great for you to join us. Thank you for spending some time and uh, having a, a, a bit of a, a digital chat in our uh, uh, digital content forum preview show. Before we get started, and this is something that I was chatting with Chris earlier on in the show, you're also really experienced digital expert. So it'd be really interesting for us if you could just highlight a little bit your career so far, what your experience has been within the digital content sector. Yeah, for sure. So um, my digital content career started back in 2015, which was probably the start of the branded content market, I guess, or industry within within social at least, um, where I joined Unilad as a startup who had, uh, I think it was six or seven employees when I first started, um, maybe a few million fans on one Facebook page. Um, and then I was the commercial director that grew and oversaw the commercial team to grow their, uh, their grow their revenues. And, you know, I was there for three and a half years managing the commercial team, took it up to about 36, 37 people and built a whole commercial model for Unilad on social branded content. Was that mainly Facebook then, you say? Was that mainly the Facebook page that, that was the centre of everything for, for Unilad? At the beginning, it was definitely a Facebook page that started it all off. We quickly got onto Instagram as soon as we possibly could do when that started becoming more and more popular. We didn't make the leap onto YouTube because YouTube content was actually consumed in a very different way uh, and still is to this day than, than Facebook. But we were very much like a, an in-feed based content business uh, where we were creating, at the beginning, it was creating viral videos um, that would get millions and millions of views on Facebook uh, and or Instagram. And that's how we started it off. And just for, for those who, who are not necessarily aware, you said that, you know, videos on YouTube and Facebook are sort of consumed in different ways. Can you just expand on that a little bit and just tell us why they're consumed in different ways and what sort of content works on those different platforms specifically? The reason that we um, built such a big following on Facebook and, and concentrated our commercial efforts on Facebook at Unilad was because it was all short form. And this was before the Facebook had changed their algorithm to make it, a, you know, you must hit three minutes to get prioritized in the algorithm. It was very much you could make a minute long video, you make a 30 second video and you can see upwards of, you know, 100 million views um, in, at that time. YouTube has always been a lot more. The user is choosing to watch that content and they often choose to watch things that are much longer in duration than the 30 second minute long video that they haven't necessarily asked to have been served. Because of that, the, the the duration was shorter, therefore the production was, was cheaper uh, and we could do more of them. It was a much more of a volume-based game, so we'd be distributing more, more content to more people rather than focusing on a much bigger production where you get less assets, but you do it for a much longer period of time. What was next after Unilad then? So after Unilad, uh, Unilad was, as everybody probably uh, listening is, is aware, was, was bought by Lab Bible. I always liken that to, you know, uh, Spurs buying Arsenal, having gone many years, were competing head to head, and then being sold to your to your biggest rival uh, was quite was quite an experience. But after that, I then worked for myself for a little bit. I took a bit of time out, 
um, worked, set up a consultancy uh, and did a couple of projects for, one was for Social Chain, uh, which was a social media agency based in Manchester, uh, which was over, uh, well, actually what I was doing there was kind of advising them on their commercial operations as they built out more of a, a media offering across the accounts that, that they ran, which was mainly Facebook, Twitter uh, and Instagram accounts at the time. Uh, and then I did uh, another project for, for Vice, where again, I looked at their commercial operations and recommended a new uh, commercial way of working in terms of how they were valuing social. It was a very different uh, distribution model to to how the market was operating at the time. And so I just recommended them to you know distribute in a way that was more in line with how everybody else was doing uh, and therefore uh, make themselves a little bit more profitable in, in doing so. Mm. And after that, after I'd um, worked for myself for a bit and, and, and done those two projects, I was asked by Channel 4 to come and set up 4Studio commercially. So 4Studio is... If, uh, if anybody doesn't know what it is, is, is Channel 4's social arm um, and was initially an idea that Channel 4 had had to create content to distribute on social platforms to audiences that weren't actually watching linear TV and maybe to have a way in which um, to uh, appeal to and engage with younger audiences in particular. And to do so, they also needed to to fund it, really, and to, and to make it a commercially viable opportunity and for me that was going in setting up the sales team the commercial team and taking it to market launching it in 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 the across the the mainly the london agencies to start off with uh, and taking out what that offering would be for brands to actually commission branded content on channel four social platforms to to a channel four audience all during lockdown we ended up doing it i think it was two or three months after the pandemic really really hit and um you know we was in peak lockdown and uh, i remember me and uh, the commissioning team at Channel 4 were doing virtual roadshows where we were presenting what the opportunity was for agencies and brands, you know, to hundreds of people at a time, all from the comfort of our living rooms or working from home, which was quite a fun experience. I bet it was, yeah. From a traditional TV industry community through the last two years and 18 months, you know, there's the, there's been a, a noticeable shift towards digital and the realisation that there are commercial opportunities there that possibly weren't there previous to that. Mm -hmm. How was it, you know, launching for Studio then from a commercial perspective? And I guess it's probably not too difficult a sell to media agencies and media buyers. But generally, how easy or difficult was it to get over the concept of a social media native content from Channel 4? Um, yeah, good question. I think, well, the initial rollout was received really well. And, you know, we were getting lots of great feedback. We were getting a number of different briefs coming through from a mixture of, of clients from the from the different agencies and the different teams that were working on those clients. The fact that it was it was new for Channel 4 to be doing it in a space where they had potentially thought or seen that the some of the other people, including my previous employers, may or may not have been as reputable as Channel 4, really gave advertisers that trust and that confidence in the quality of whatever they were to do would come with a Channel 4 seal of approval, which for some of the, you know, the bigger advertisers and people like the government as well, that um, became a, a very successful model. And we, we, within the first year, we, uh, we, you know, we exceeded our sales revenue targets. We became the number one branded content publisher in the UK. From launch, it was received really well. Mm. Where the challenge was, was where Channel 4 and, and me in particular, when I was at Channel 4 there, I wanted to bring more youth skewed brands to Channel 4. And the challenge for us, or I always wanted to go and work with an Adidas or with a New Balance or with the Vans, for example, and bring them into Channel 4 because they wouldn't necessarily be the advertisers that were looking to spend on linear TV because that wasn't reaching the right audience. So I was looking to bring those advertisers on board. We actually saw a much bigger uptake from the more traditional advertisers who were used to spending with Channel 4 anyway, um, but just to, in a different way to reach those younger audiences. Do you think then that 4 Studios and Channel 4 legitimised brand-funded social content for a lot of a lot of the media buying agencies and brands then in the UK? 
I, I think for some clients, but I think that I, I wouldn't say that actually. I would I wouldn't go as far as to say that because the work that Lab Bible had done, that Unilab, the Jungle, that Vice had done, BuzzFeed even in the early days, um, even Joe Media to pave the way for Channel Four to actually decide to set up a commercial operation around social, they really showed the broadcasters and the bigger media owners that there was money to be made here if done well. And you can also create content that's not only brand funded, but that can also reach younger audiences. So I think that I'd be doing a disservice to those that paved the way by saying that it legitimized it. I think the fact that the success that the previous guys have had and still have within that world, and arguably because they're native social publishers, to probably do it in a way that's a little bit more natural to, to the to the younger audiences. I think they are the ones who really legitimized it in the first place and Channel 4 came in and kind of capitalized on it and brought it out to some clients that were maybe wavering or maybe had not decided to take that plunge, you know, from 2015, 2016 when it really 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 kicked in and it took a few years for them to actually gain the confidence to want to do it themselves. And was the majority of content that you were producing there, was it a case of, I don't know, a pizza brand or wanting to communicate with younger audience and just looking for stuff to sponsor? Or was it more about we've got a budget that we want to actually fund something where our brand is integrated into the actual content itself? And so it was very much open to pitches and ideas from third party producers. How, how did that work in, in, in the main? We went to market when we launched Full Studio with a very specific way of working, and that was brief-led or proactive content ideas that we were looking for brand funding. So very much, a, if you take the ASP model, the linear ASP model, we replicated that from a social point of view, but looking for a brand to fund 100% of it, because at that time, there was no commissioning budget to part fund uh, any of the of the social content that we were making. That was the model that... I replicated after my time at Unilad and my time at the the other social publishers as well, because that's what the that's the that's the model that the industry understood at the time. But what happened and what transpired when you when you actually get in at Channel Four when I was there and I understood just the pure size of the business and the way they make they make money, then actually social became an extension of other ways in which they were operating and in particular in sponsorship. So I implemented, you know, to the sponsorship team, they, they weren't at that time, including social in any sponsorship deal. It would be linear sponsorship and digital all four sponsorship. And I said, well, look, all of these views you're getting in, in the case of something like Gogglebox or First Dates, it was, you know, they're talking about the tens of millions of views on every series that they would get on, on social across Facebook, across YouTube, across Instagram. Then we actually then... Um, added social into the sponsorship opportunity for, for brands as well. Um, and what that meant for brands in particular was that gave them the ability to then reach audiences on different platforms at different times, but give that whole consistency message that wherever you see this content, you have the association with three mobile, for example, who sponsored uh, Gogglebox at the time. Not sure if they still do. I think they might do. That was just looking at across Channel 4's portfolio of of, uh, of products and ways in which they make money to then include social. Um, another another thing that that I introduced when I was there was to be more competitive against the likes of you know Lab Bible and Jungle, who were doing a phenomenal um, job at the time of of hoovering up all the social branded content briefs between the two of them. I knew it was going to be a very competitive marketplace for us to enter, but we had something that they didn't, and that's a linear channel, or and all four as well as, as a digital channel. Um, so within our offering, we started making ads. We would create the social branded content series, and we would also create an ad as well. And that ad would then exclusively live on Channel 4 Linear or All 4 itself. So you would then start tapping into other media owner budgets, sorry, other media budgets at the agencies. So we could start to actually apply economies of scale on them, not having to go outside to an external production company or creative agency to make uh, an ad for that specific campaign. Through the whole production process and the shoot itself, we would be creating your social branded content series, which we would distribute across Channel 4 socials, plus your advert, which we would then distribute across Channel 4 and, and, and all four. Um, and there we can tap into bigger media budgets as well, which right. uh, Channel 4's rest of the sales team were 
quite happy to to uh, see that revenue coming in as well. Mm, I bet they were. Yeah. Okay. And so then then you moved on to BBC Studios then. Yeah. So previously to where I am now, which is at Cowshed, I was at um, BBC Studios as um, VP of Commercial and Digital Team, where uh, I was overseeing all of the um, social revenue for BBC Studios. BBC Studios operates between 80 and 90 social accounts, I would say, and across all platforms, YouTube being their main one. And the the role there was very much to work really closely with the programming team and Athena Witter and uh, and the programming team, of which Chris was was a part of, in creating content or, or, or ensuring that the distribution of the content that they're making was making as much money from ad revenue as possible. And that was the that was the main model for BBC Studios in terms of driving social revenue was was through rev share models with the with the platforms themselves. Whilst I was there, I also oversaw a deal with TikTok um, and one with Snapchat to get BBC Studios content and and channels like BBC Studios channels launched on those platforms so that they can build audiences up on TikTok in time for when their their revenue monetization program starts, which hopefully will be any day soon. Um, And on Snap, we're very much to create specific Snap shows of the um, the four brands that we launched on there to appeal to even younger audiences. Um, so you're mm. more your 13 to 24, 24 mark. And it was, it was very much because of the strategy to have the BBC content, which is arguably some of the most, you know, best produced content in the world and the catalog and archive of content that they have with those such, those power brands appearing in as many places as possible to as many people as possible across the world it wasn't a, a uk focused role it was very much a, a globally a global focused role to really drive um that association and that awareness of that brand and of that show um with also with an, with a slight nod to to public service in understanding that they uh, are always looking to drive the audience back to iplayer Interesting what you say there. I mean, putting BBC Studios aside for the moment, you you talked about a network, I think you mentioned TikTok or other social channels that don't actually have a revenue generating model in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, How does that work? I mean, how does a new social video network convince a major broadcaster or, you know, or even a uh, independent production studio to build their own channel there when they when you're not sure what revenue is going to be coming and when i mean what what what's that process like what are those conversations like it's a, it's a tough one to be honest because the way that market's going now and the rise of vertical video and like the actual explosion of tiktok and just how popular that is that's obviously spawned off all the other platforms to actually concentrate more on their vertical video properties. And f- Facebook and Instagram Reels, which launched after Snapchat had, in- had initially launched, has never been monetizable. TikTok then launches, and then that hasn't been monetizable for in, in an ad revenue perspective. Like you can you can monetize these platforms um, through their vertical video products through branded content. So you can, and that's how they they say that's how they encourage um, publishers, I guess, or creators uh, and influencers onto their platforms to work with brands directly, and then through their platform, which is the distribution of that, you you, you know, that's how you get your money. Um, but in in terms of publishing organic content in return for for ad revenue, um, only YouTube and Facebook are the ones that offer a, a rev share and Snapchat do, um, but you have to do a, a, have, a, have, a, have a deal with them. So it's it's a tricky one now because that is the way that the market is going. I was, I was at a TikTok event the other day and they said that um, a user spends over 90 minutes on their platform in any one session uh, viewing well over 200 videos. So you, how do you cut through that if your audience are there for that amount of time watching that many videos how can you cut through with a piece of branded content? It's really, really tricky. But if you were part of that, whether one of those 200 videos, which is an organic, um, you know, really cheaply shot piece to camera um, piece of content that you then rack up millions of views on, then you are eventually going to be eligible for an ad revenue share. So for the bigger media owners, it's difficult because bigger media owners comes with much higher production value and, and quality within it. And it's not as natural a viewing experience for the user to watch something vertically if they're more used to watching 
the same show or the same piece of content horizontally on a, on a TV. I think for production companies in particular, they need to have that expertise in-house to understand how these platforms work um, and what how they can benefit the, the actual the, the, the content they're creating. But as a, as a publisher, um, it's, it, the, the reason to be on there now is to build audience and to when I mean YouTube are bringing in their YouTube shorts monetization programs uh, in Q1 of next year. If you have the audience on there already, and then you're hitting the barriers that you are required for for success with the monetization, then you will start to see uh, a revenue share and a decent revenue stream trickling in. But at the moment, without that in market, it's it's hard to build a business off it because you don't know how much revenue you're actually going to make. So a lot of these platforms are actually relying on media owners to to trust them and you know and to invest in them if you like in terms of building their audience and the time and the production costs that that entails in the hope or in the expectation that there are future revenues once you've got that you know certain audience so that's that's you know it's quite it's an interesting dynamic when a lot of these businesses are you know obviously multi-million or multi-billion dollar businesses in their own right is that revenue backdated as well typically once youtube short starts to monetize and starts to pay out is that from sort of day one when they say right we're paying out from this date or is it well you know all of your views going back from when you first started your shorts channel we're going to pay for that or don't you know i mean is that still to be decided uh, yeah, I, actually, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't think it is backdated. I think that they will introduce monetization on that date and anything you get moving forward, will you'll be eligible for. But where it is backdated in the social world, I guess, is that anything that you've uploaded will be eligible from that date. So if you've uploaded a YouTube short a year ago um, and then that starts to see traction and get some more views after the monetization program kicks in, those views will be eligible for monetization. So it's not right. that's the thing with YouTube uh, in particular is you know that that content is evergreen or should be evergreen and, and stays up for as long as possible. I know that a lot of the, the the revenue that BBC Studios saw from YouTube was from videos that were published you know um, a few many years ago, and that's that's probably similar mm. to, across the, across the board. Um, it's not all revenue isn't driven by the new uploads. It's new uploads and your archive stuff that you've got on that channel and how you can actually ensure that that content keeps getting seen because that's the um, challenge for the editorial teams is that you want to make it as evergreen as possible so if you upload it today someone can watch it today and someone can watch it in 10 years time and in that in between those 10 years you're still you're seeing the ad revenue um, go up and up and up that's the difference yeah. between YouTube and the other platforms, though, because the other platforms being, you know, news feed based or feed based platforms, um, that content disappears after 24, 48 hours. Uh, and you don't really see a resurrection in views again, unless for some reason it, it you know, it goes viral again. Uh, for mm. sometimes that happens at specific times of year, whether it might be might be World Cup now, for example, or it might be Christmas stuff. Things get resurrected because of the time of year, but that's quite rare. Interesting. Tell us about Cowshed and what you're doing to, uh, at the business. So yeah, I mean, I've, so I've been in in this social branded content world for about seven years, and during that time, I, I see different ships. You know, when when I joined Unilad, I actually joined from the Mirror, where I was um, head of digital advertising for Sport there. Um, but it was very much, uh, you know, a, an advertising-led um, proposition. And I just thought that there's got to be a better way for <laughs> advertisers to reach young people because at the moment they're not they're not really doing it. This was just when Unilad Lab Bible and BuzzFeed were all kind of starting out in the UK. And <clears throat> there was a shift towards that type of content being consumed, but advertisers weren't involved with it just yet. And I think that fast forward to then Channel 4, when Channel 4 got into the game because they saw the, the, the success of the social publishers and they decided that you know they wanted a piece of that as well because it's a legitimate business now. I think that the uh, where the market is going now is brands and creators, talent and creators, can do a lot of this themselves. They can create branded content themselves on their own channels. Brands can hire the talent themselves to either be in the videos on their channels or on the brand channels and you know I, th I think that that's where the 
the shift in in consumption is going but also where brands probably want to see themselves as, as creating more of a an engaging proposition and engaging content proposition for their audiences um, and that's what really attracted me to cowshed cowshed haven't been going have been going on for that long i mean they're probably three or four years old now and started off as a social production company um led by george cowan and, and ryan o'shea and they have built a business organically off the back of creating content for brand channels which is editorially led so if you go onto the foot asylum youtube channel for example you will see the content that cow should produce and it's it's not promotional it's not advertising it's very engaging editorial long form youtube content which uses young creators that appeal to that the audience that foot asylum want to appeal to and that is where they get their success from and that's what makes foot asylum so happy with the content that we're that we're producing um and it's on in return it's grown their youtube following um and it's bringing people back to to their brand and off the back of the content that we create for them which is you know, to bring people in and have them engage with the brand and 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 be you know feel feel love for the brand. They then do their direct messaging, direct marketing off the off the back of that. So we build an audience through that way, and then they go and actually do the more direct ROI sales related stuff off the back of that off the back of that content. I think that's a really interesting um, proposition and, and way of working for for brands. Is is you know, we've got a saying here that you don't need to borrow someone else's audiences. You can create your own. And the best way to do that is by finding content that people watch with people with talent that people um, that people like as well. So as as part of um, Cowshed, we have a, a a creator division where we can we also create branded content for creators, but we also manage those creators, um, managing their socials, do their brand deals, film producing podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. So we're bringing that whole world together where brands, if they want to be involved in social, we can do it for their own channel, we can do it with uh, on the on a talents channel, or we can bring it together where we have that talent feature in the content we produce for them. Right. Okay. And just going back to Foot Asylum then, I mean, that's re- a really good example of brand as publisher, right? Because as you say, it's their own yes. YouTube tra- channel. Are there any explicit mentions of Foot Asylum during the show? I mean, are, is it, you know, are there any long lingering shots of new trainers <laughs> or anything? Or, you know, yeah. is it completely hands off? And just the very fact that they're watching it on Foot Asylum's YouTube channel, is that the sort of... Uh, implicit you know messaging as opposed to explicit and then the, as you say they follow up with the direct sales leads no do you know what i mean i haven't watched everything that we've produced for, for foot asylum because we produce over 100 videos every single year but the last the last series that we did do was called locked in um so if any of your listeners are listening to this go and check it out on youtube it's a, a reality series that's just gone out on, on foot asylum's uh, youtube channel um and the actual talent within it so it's unscripted but the talent within it, um, the contestants within within it, will be calling out Foot Asylum quite a lot. Um, the challenges are named after Foot Asylum. There is there is branding in the background of, of the shots. Um, Foot Asylum provide all the clothing that all of the talent wear within the show, for example. So there are some overt pieces of branding. There are some not so overt pieces of branding, but maybe a little bit more subtle, but it all kind of comes together for the show and i think that foot asylum are now at a place where because as you say because they are now a publisher then talent and the audience are quite happy for them to play that role their their authenticity in this space has now been solidified because of the type of content and the creators that they use within it i think it takes a bit of time to get there i don't think every brand can start off in that space but it doesn't take too long i think it just comes down to who the audience is you're trying to reach and being an authentic vehicle in the content that you create to reach them. Well, it certainly seems to be working because you've uh, just jumped onto uh, Foot Asylum's YouTube channel. You've got uh, 2.13 million subscribers, which is uh, quite amazing for a uh, trainer retailer and obviously clothing brand and all the other things that no doubt they're, uh, they're selling as well. But that's a really good example of, you know, brands now becoming publishers and becoming networks channels essentially so uh very interesting stuff 
And now it's time for Story of the Week, where Matt highlights the content industry news story that's caught his eye in the past seven days. What's your story of the week, Matt? My story of the week is, um, I don't know if you've seen this in the, in the press, but Meta are going to host a, um, a, a gig, a VR gig for, for Biggie, for Notorious B.I.G., that you can exclusively watch in the Metaverse. It can take place in their, in their Horizon Worlds <clears throat> section on 16th of December. And I think this is incredible. They're bringing back Biggie, which is which is amazing, and you know, in its in its in itself. Um, but they're making it super accessible for if you've got an Oculus, you get the full VR experience. If you don't have one, you can just watch it in two D on 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 Biggie's Facebook page. And I just think that for anybody who is a fan of his music back in the day, and obviously still now, you can actually experience it in a way that is going to be. How, how in a way that technology is going to actually bring this into um into the forefront of of of, of, of how people can can watch it but i think more so um i just wonder whether this is the future of of where music might be heading um because i don't know if you saw the all that stuff with the reselling of taylor swift's yes. tickets ticket master's disaster yeah absolutely it's crazy to me that you can go on to Ticketmaster or any of these t- ticket sales and you sit in a queue for hours and hours and hours only to be told that they've sold out. And then five minutes later, that ticket that you were in the queue for is now 22 grand on a re- ticket reseller website. And you just think that if that's the way that the industry is going to go, then real fans are getting cheated because, you know, in that instance, Taylor Swift's fan base are probably 14, 15 year old teenagers. They're not going to have anywhere near that amount of money to spend on on watching her live if they've missed out on something what's to say that taylor swift doesn't decide actually i'm going to go and do a gig in the metaverse and they can watch it for free and therefore they can actually you know i know you lose the the actual the good bit about going to a live show and I'm, i don't think this is going to displace that in any way because if you're a music fan you want to go to live shows but you never can go to as many as you want to if this becomes the norm then you know it's just going to be more accessible more people can watch more music in the metaverse and i think that is something that's actually you know really interesting and and actually a reason that why i quite like the metaverse and what it can offer i think that's a in a very uh, interesting development i mean i've been in there a few times and uh, i think it was a foo foo fighters did a gig which was a live show and you got the opportunity to sort of watch it in in like a virtual club which was kind of yeah. this is great it's a bit weird when somebody comes up and starts talking to you i'm like oh yeah. that, that's it for me i'm a bit freaked out yeah. but you know as you say i mean the, it's it, it's interesting the way that digital and live music particularly particularly live music, is starting to converge. I mean, you just have to look at the ABBA arena that's in London, which is essentially mm. avatars, projections, or whatever the technology is. So that's that's the yeah. op- almost the opposite, where people are going in real life to watch avatars. Here we've got a new hyper-realistic avatar of Biggie being recreated and appearing in the metaverse which is uh yeah it's really really exciting stuff and uh i think these are the sorts of things that are starting to widen the opportunity within the metaverse because it's still you know for many people it still feels a little bit too far away but you know all of these big events that are coming coming down the track you know it, it makes it a little bit easier a little bit more accessible for people to get involved in it it's an exciting space it's also the um, the additional content opportunities that spring out from something like this. So it's not they're not just doing the gig in the metaverse for which you know Biggie is there and Puffy's there and like Junior Mafia and the Locks and stuff are all going to be there and they're all going to perform live themselves. Um, actually, users get to um, go through and, and, and visit a, like a virtual recre- recreation of Biggie's hometown in Brooklyn, which they're calling the. Uh, narrative journey so you can go through this narrative journey of a day in the life of biggie back in brooklyn uh, and what it was like for him to you know live where he lived and in the time that he lived in back in the 90s um, to, and then watch him in concert so that's a very different experience obviously to just going directly to a gig 
at the O2 in Brixton or whatever, where you go there, watch the gig, and then you and then you leave. This is actually giving the audience a you know almost like a richer content experience whilst they're in the metaverse. That to me is like a, another super interesting opportunity to see how that develops and how people can actually tie in, use the use the crux of the gig is to get people there, but what else can you do with them whilst they're there beforehand, afterwards, interactive, whatever it might be. Yeah, very interesting. Will we see Cowshed getting involved in the metaverse and creating metaverse experiences, do you think, in the future? <laughs> I mean, I'd, lo I'd love to say that we would do. You know, I think we're we're on a journey now where the next stage of Cowshed is is to is to launch as the as the collective and as as part of that we're looking for you know new new ways in which we can bring content to people um you know through through our, the qualities of the production that we can have and the talent and, and and creator access that we've got as well so so for sure I mean a big part of the reason I've joined is the fact that I can work for a small company again and be innovative and go and explore these opportunities and see if it's something that we want to get involved in and we see value in and you know taking it to, to audiences and brands to, to, um, to get involved in as well. And now it's time for Matt's Hero of the Week and to find out who or what he's telling to get in the bin. Who's your Hero of the Week, Matt? Uh, my Hero of the Week, I'm actually going to give it to my previous employer. I'm actually going to give it to Channel 4 for their launch of 4.0. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it's uh, It was launched a few weeks ago. I was at their launch party, uh, lucky enough to be invited to their launch party a few, uh, last week, a week before last. Um, and what Channel 4.0 is, is it's a YouTube channel that is dedicated specifically to UK content creators and giving them their own shows. So it's supporting UK creators, it's supporting UK production companies, and it's taking that UK content, putting it on YouTube and giving them their own show. For those who may or may not have the chance to be on linear tv maybe they want to maybe they don't want to be on linear tv at all in the future but it's about you know looking around the whole creator space on youtube and saying right we're going to give you a show on channel 4 channel 4.0 on youtube let's see how you get on and i think that this the you know the fact that they've gone out to as a lot of different creators to do this um and really are like putting their money where their mouth is and supporting the UK industry, like creator and production industry for, from a digital perspective. I know that's their, that's been their MO, MO from day one, from a linear perspective and doing it digitally. Um, that's really leading the charge. That's showing the other broadcasters, this is what you've got to do if you want to invest in digital content and a digital original content. No, that's uh, that's really exciting. I wonder if they're after a business to business content industry show on uh, Channel Four Point Zero. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll uh, have a quiet word with Laura Marks when she's speaking at the uh, at the Telecast Digital Content Forum. Never know. Well, why don't why don't we produce it and we can pitch it together? Deal done. Deal done. That's fantastic. <laughs> Who or what's going in the bin, Matt? Elon Musk is going in the bin. Musk. And I don't know whether this is what the, all your other guests have said as well, but it feels like every single day he does something else to Twitter to try and shut Twitter down. And it would be a real shame if actually the rumours are true and that a lot of the actual key engineers decided to take him up on his offer of um, you either must stay and work much, much harder uh, or you can leave for three months' pay. Um, and rumours are that you know 75% took him up on his offer and some of them might be key engineers in which, you know, the back end of Twitter may not be running as operationally as uh, smoothly as it, as, it, as it once did. I hope none of that's true because it would be really it'd be a massive shame to see to see that go down. But, you know, it, if it does, he's only got himself to blame the way that he's come in and he's handled that whole situation. For me, it just shows he's, you know, maybe not quite as in tune with the way in which uh, the world of tech start, the tech, the tech world works. Um, yeah. Should we say? Well, it's a different, uh, different engineering challenge. Sending rockets up and down uh, into space and sorting out a, uh, a social media network. I'm sure exactly. we'll see. We'll see how he gets on. Matt, thank you so much for joining me this week. Really looking forward to uh, to you also joining us at the Telecast Digital Content Forum on the brand funded social content panel which is going to be a really interesting chat and we've obviously got you know lots of other leaders on there we've we've got sam glynn from uta we've got john farrah from future studios we've got laura marks i mentioned from channel four and kate noran from bbc studios as moderator so it's going to be a really fascinating chat 
yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Can't wait. Next Wednesday. So bring it on. Mm. That's right. We're the 30th of November at the BFI South Bank. Uh, Matt, thanks again. We'll see you down at the South Bank. Look forward to it and good luck with Cowshed. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Justin. See you soon. Well, that's about it for another week's show. There are still some tickets left for the Telecast Digital Content Forum, sponsored by BBC Studios. And you can buy these at telecast.com forward slash events. But be quick, we're expecting it to sell out. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in London. Until next week, stay safe.